Vadim and I have been using and testing the iPhone 14s for close to two weeks now, and although the 14 Pro Max is by far my favorite iPhone, and I highly recommend it to anybody wanting to upgrade, there are still some software and hardware limitations that you should be aware of before buying. So I'm gonna be discussing those in this video, as well as some solutions to some of the problems, so let's get right into it. The first one is battery life. The last few years, iPhones have been amazing with battery life, but unfortunately, this year, it is different. Now, I ignored the battery life the first few days since I was using it so much, but I was shocked on my first normal use day when my 14 Pro Max was at 18% battery before 4.30 p.m. I hoped that it would get better the following week, but nope. And even Angelica commented that this past weekend, she was having a top off her 14 Pro each day before the day was over. Now this is because of a few new features that are nice, but kill the battery. And thankfully, there are a few adjustments that can be made to help, which I'll share after the next few problems. The second is the display brightness. Now I love that it gets super bright outdoors and that's very helpful, but as I was shooting videos for my insanely detailed camera comparison between the 14, the 13, and 12 Pro Max. By the way, make sure you guys are subscribed so you guys don't miss that. I noticed that the 14 series consistently chooses a higher auto brightness than the rest of the older phones, and in my regular use, I kept having to manually turn it down in the evenings. This might be because Apple added a second ambient light sensor, which is now in the back, and it's helpful since it will bump up the brightness if you have the sun or something else that is bright behind it, whereas the 13s and older wouldn't, but I would still love to have an auto brightness preference adjustment in the settings. Third is the always on display, which I also love, and I talked about how much better it was than Samsung's, but I keep finding it too bright in many scenarios, making it look like the phone is on. Now the phone does automatically adjust the brightness of the always on display, but just like the regular screen brightness, it biases too bright. And of course, all of these are leading to worse battery life, so here are some workarounds. While we still don't have a way to adjust the auto brightness, one thing you could do is to use manual brightness for the times that you don't need the super crazy 2000 nits that really drains your battery, so the manual won't allow that. The only thing is that unlike Android, it is a pain to find the setting on an iPhone. But what I did was use shortcuts to create a link workaround, and I placed that shortcut on my homepage that automatically opens the settings so I can quickly adjust that. For the always on display, instead of just turning it off like some have, I created a custom focus mode where nothing is changed other than dimming the lock screen super dark while still showing off my nice wallpaper when I raise it. This will save battery life while still showing widgets and notifications and if you want to take this further, I changed the text and the icons colors to red, which is the color that has the lowest power usage for OLED displays, and it still pops with the screen dimming mode. If you want to go even further, set your lock screen to a full black image. So maybe Samsung was right with their always on. Since we're talking about battery life, we should cover chargers. Now everybody knows that Apple no longer gives you a charger in the box, but that is not the problem. What is, is the fact that they recommend their own 20 watt Apple charging brick, even though the new 14 Pro accepts up to 28 watts of charging and runs at 25 and 26, and the Max runs at 27, peaking at 29. So if you're gonna buy one, make sure to buy a 30 watt model so it will charge faster and be more future-proof, even on regular iPhones. Thankfully, Basis partnered up with us to show off their new 30 watt Super Psi Pro Quick Chargers, which support full speed PD fast charging with enhanced temperature control, but they also come with an additional USB type A port for broad compatibility, as well as foldable prongs that make it much more compact than Apple's version. Not only that, but they've also got their Adamant 2 10,000 milliamp hour palm sized power bank, which literally has three times the battery capacity of the iPhone 14 Pro, and it also supports full speed PD 30 watt fast charging, just like the Super Psi Pro. On top of that, it comes with a high quality metal casing for durability, as well as a convenient display to check how much battery it has left. And it gets two extra USB Type A ports so you can charge three devices at once. And the power bank itself has fast charging capability as well and can be fully charged in two hours and 45 minutes. So go ahead and check out this basis charger and the power bank by using the links in the video description below. The next one is screen dimming. We talked about this a lot with the iPhone 12 Pros and Pro Maxes, the 13s, and with the 14s, it has gotten a lot better, 
But what I have found is that the iPhone 14 Pro actually dims more so than the 14 Pro Max. And that makes sense because it's a smaller body, so the heat has less area to expand to. And that is just a little bit annoying because it's still there. So if you don't want to deal with screen dimming, if you want that ultimate brightness outside, if you're going to do stuff like drones, I would suggest go for the 14 Pro Max. The next one is eSIM. Now I've mentioned this before how it sucks that Apple did this in some countries and that even though it was easy to switch over to eSIM, I still had some issues with some calls not coming through. I had some weird pop-ups and then the last couple days, my wife is trying to send me text and uh, images and it just wasn't coming through. I wish that Apple stuck with the SIM models everywhere because there's just an empty space where the SIM used to be in these phones and I know some people straight up didn't buy a new iPhone 14 because their carrier did not support it. So they bought a 13 series phone instead. And now I wanna switch over to the cameras because we do have some issues and I also have some workarounds with you. Now the first one I wanna talk about is video. This phone is amazing at shooting video, has the new action mode, the cinematic mode is a lot better, but what Apple did not give us is 8K video. Now when we had the leaks of a 48 megapixel Pixel camera coming to the iPhone 14 Pro and Pro Max, we thought that that was because of 8K video. That is because this sensor is perfect for shooting 8K video without having a big crop like you get with the Samsung phones, but unfortunately Apple didn't give it to us, and I think that this is just an excuse to add it next year uh, while giving you a good reason to upgrade. Now if you don't believe that Apple is just holding this back, think of last year with the iPhone 13 series where cinematic mode could only shoot 10 1080p without HDR is limited to 30 FPS. We thought that this was a hardware limitation, but now with the iPhone 14, this thing does the 4K HDR cinematic mode, even though it uses the same camera as the 13 Pro and the same processor. So it is not a hardware limitation, but a software. And even though it came out now with the same hardware, Apple is not adding it as a software update to the 13 Pro phone. So that is just them getting you to upgrade. Now I know some people say, why do you even need 8K video. Well, you can say the same thing with 4K or even 1080p before that. Personally, if the hardware is capable, I would rather have the best resolution possible so that five years, 10 years from now, when I have uh, footage of my kids, places we go, I have the best quality possible. And now let's switch over to photos. Apple is really hyping up the 48 megapixel sensor, all the detail that you'll get from it. But the problem is if you're just taking regular photos and they're using their quad bayer technology, the photos don't look any more detailed uh, than the iPhone 13 Pro photos, at least in most lighting conditions. That's because Apple is compressing all of those to 12 megapixels and uh, they're recording in HEIC and the detail just isn't there. Now, when we switch over to Apple 48 megapixel Pro RAW, it looks so much better in every single way. But the problem is that the file sizes go from around two to three megabytes to around 75. They are massive. And Apple doesn't give us an option to make small files that are compressed, not raw, like Samsung does. And even worse is that there is no easy way to convert these huge files into compressed ones that are gonna be roughly three, four times larger than the 12 megapixel ones. Online, Apple says that it's gonna take up a lot of storage, so you'll probably wanna upgrade your phone to more storage, or their option is to save to iCloud and then download, and then that's gonna eat up your iCloud space and your data. And of course, they have a link just to bring you to getting iCloud or upgrading your storage. Now, I searched everywhere how to do this, and the easiest Way, if you can believe it, is to edit the photo first, then upload to your files app, let it upload to the cloud, and then you take that, re-download it, send it to photos, and that will convert it, and that will make the file size roughly around 16 or so megabytes instead of being 75. Thankfully, the quality of that file is very similar to the raw file, a little bit more compression, a little bit sharper, but that just saves so much space. Now, if you don't like doing this method and having to find the photo, delete the old one, you can actually download the Highlight app, which is a paid app, and that will allow you to take photos right away in that converted format. It's about 15 megabytes, it's HIC, so it's higher quality, and it looks slightly better than the converted files themselves, and even slightly sharper than Apple's Pro Raw file. Now, no, this video is not sponsored by Halide, but I just thought it was really cool that you're able to do that. And with that, they even have options to add widgets to your lock screen so you can quick open that app for those images when you want the 
that detail or even jump into the ultra wide, the regular or the telephoto mode. So it's definitely a cool app, but you do have to pay for it. Now, the next one is kind of tied into this and that is the fact that the lightning port is still here and even worse, it is still USB 2.0, which is insanely slow. The old Samsung S8 Plus was USB 3.1. And when I was transferring these huge ProRAW files to offload them, I was getting around 20, 25 megabyte per second transfer speeds instead of what could be about 400, 450. And we have shown you guys that the storage that is in here is insanely fast, even faster than the fast ones last year. So it's more than capable, but Apple is just limiting it probably because they wanna bring USB Type-C next year or even Thunderbolt and make it a much bigger deal. And lastly, I have this very simple one, but I keep running into this issue. And that is the fact that the earpiece speaker no longer has a grill right there at the glass. And because of that stuff keeps jamming into there and it's a pain to clean out because the slit is very small. So what I found as a solution is to have a can of air and that's the easiest way to blow all that stuff, lint, whatever out of there and to keep it clean and of course sounding its best. So there you guys go. Those are my top 10 problems with this phone after using it for close to two weeks. Hopefully all the solutions that I gave you guys helped you guys out. Click above to subscribe there if you guys wanna see my ultimate camera comparison with the past two generations and then this new one. Check out that video right over there. This has been Max and I'll see you in the next one.